Yeah, okay. So we'll keep this result. I'm going to remove this so I can have space for it. And now, now we want to take this function and also take the, the gradient for at theta equals c to zero, right? So then, at theta equals c to theta zero, remember we have an optimal discriminator. So that. And remember that uh, this is your this is your data delta. This is minus your delta, delta theta, right? When you do gradient descent, right? It's the negative gradient. So, uh, right? Look, d star of x because we said we're at theta zero. Okay, and we can divide and um, multiply this by 1 minus d star, okay? So that will be, and then we can also move the gradient inside, because this is a linear uh, operator, right? So then minus log d star x, 1 minus d star x. And then plus or minus is that minus? No, sorry, plus. And just two seconds. Yep, one second. <coughs> um, e. log 1 minus d star. Yeah. Okay. Cool. This thing here... Okay, yeah, that's what we want to end up. This thing here... Oh, and remember there's a minus everywhere, right? So, so this thing here is what we came up with here, except that this, these are flipped, but then we can, we can invert the sign for that. So then this is equal to the kubat leibler of pg theta over pd. And then this is what we were minimizing all along the other times. This is, the, this is the, what we were minimizing in the saturating game. And we know that this is going to be two Jensen sounding divergences. The, the gradient of two Jensen sounding Also the gradient of this, right? So uh, all in total, this will be the gradient of this thing. Right? Uh, sorry, but yeah, this one we said we have a lot of minus because it's minuses. Okay, so this result is actually a very interesting result. Is, is everyone clear how we got this? This one is a bit more involved. Uh, so this one does tell us something about what we see in Gantz. This one does tell us something about what we see in Gantz. We see a kubak leibler divergence of PG over PD. Now, this is where you say, oh, didn't we have that with max magnitude? We didn't have this. We had the um, PD to PG, which is a different, because the kubak leibler divergence is not symmetrical. Yeah? So what does this one say now? Okay. Uh, let's, let's put down the, the formula for it, right? So that would be PG <coughs> log PG uh, over PD, right? When PG is very small, much smaller than PD, which means I have a very low a chance of generating the sample, but the data has actually a large probability of generating the sample, then when this one is very small, uh, this one is zero. KL is small. And when this one is, uh, and then this one is much bigger than this one, this is KL is big. Okay, well, let's see what that means, though. So if I have, uh, if, if there's, there's mass on PD, but they're not on PG, right? So if we have this case, this is PD, and then PG is going to be 
like this, we see k l small. Yeah, you flipped things, but do you know? You, you wrote the same thing twice. No. Oh, yeah. speak, speak. sorry, I double flipped. Yeah, yeah. I'm confused. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Right, yes, that. So in this case, the first case, we have k l small, which means this which actually explains a lot of what we see. Because what we see in Gans' mode collapse, this is the definition of mode collapse. Basically, we've collapsed, we've, we've collapsed this mode. And the other one, the other term, uh, and in this case, uh, is, is big. And which is this case? This is the case where uh, PG is very small. Uh, this is that case, right? This gets assigned a very high penalty. So no unrealistic samples for GANs. Just mode collapse so far. OK? Does that, does that make sense? OK. And well, but so, so far, we've been dealing with this term. And this term is very weird, right? Cause, because it, it basically is the jensen chan divergence, but it's also got a negative sign to it. Yes? Is, is green PG? Green is always PG. OK, because I was confused. Cause Oh, sorry, P. Yeah, sorry. Right. No, no, sorry. P. That's right. Um, yeah, so we've got a Jensen Chan divergence here, but we've got a negative sign, which Jensen Chan divergence normally brings distribu wants distributions to be closer together, but in this case it's got a negative sign, which means it's trying to pull them apart, actually, which also accounts for what we sometimes see in GANs, which is instability. Like a lot of the times you'll, you'll run a GAN and you'll end up with trash, right? This is what's telling you that, right? when you have a, an optimally trained discriminator. So this also explains that, I can actually show you an example of this. This also explains, to some extent, uh, I'll show you an example of the counts. Uh, is it okay if I erase this? Yeah? Is it Chrome that you have? Yeah, I think it's Chrome. Not that. The other one. That one? Yeah, because, yeah. Are you sure? I'm going to do it. Oh, sorry. Okay. So this is a guy that I've been training. Um, and you'll notice, oh, we can resize this. Experience is limited. What do you want to do? Just, make it just bigger? drag it, yeah. More? Yeah, cool. Great, great. <laughs> so what we see is actually what, what, what we were promised with GANs was uh, what we were promised with GANs was that the, what we were minimizing in the case of uh, in the case of the generator was the Jensen Chan divergence to minus log four, right? Which is also what we're uh, trying to maximize with respect to, to, for the for the discriminator, right? So we're act so if we were to look at this from the discriminator point, we're trying to maximize this, which means we were going to do we were going to try to minimize this. Oh, sorry, we we're trying to maximize the. Yeah, we're trying to maximize this, right? And then th this one is going to be uh, at best zero, so the maximum is going to be log four, right? But we can see here in, our, in, in my plot that actually the discriminator is trained much, much better than that. The discriminator is actually very good. What is it? 11 micro uh, points or whatever it is, right? So that's. And, and you can see we've got good samples. So, you know, even though we've actually got realistic samples, then the discriminator is still being able to discriminate between them. And that's, that's basically what Ardowski, in, in most of his papers, deals with, basically, is why this happens. 
Okay. So. <coughs> okay, so just to summarize then. Let's summarize what we know about GANs, right? In theory, GANs, as we said, will um, be able to model the distribution perfectly. In practice, not, not so much. Uh, it's, they, so what are, the, what are their cons, right? GAN cons. First, okay. First is um, they sometimes are unstable. Yeah, so we, we, in order for them to not be unstable, we, so we proved that before. In order for them to not be unstable, we have to actually sort of strike a balance between training the discriminator and the generator. And it's hard to come up with that. There's heuristics, like when your discriminator is very good, then, then don't train it anymore. But, but those, I mean, that's very involved, right? So the, the, these require a balance between discriminator and generator. And, and a manual labor here involved, right? There's, no way of doing this somehow. Second thing is mode collapse, right? We, we also proved that with that with this formula, right? So maybe I'm going to generate a face, let's say. Uh, and ideally, if my GAN is able to generate the distribution of all faces, I should be getting very versatile faces. But not, that's not what we see in practice. We, we usually see, actually, I think women mostly. And, and so, so actually, it, it's losing some of its diversity. Uh, that might be not only about mode collapse, right? It might be. It could be about the feminist movement that's now gaining. No, it's no, not. No, it's, it's, it's bias it's also, in the data. Yeah. Bias in the data. It could be bias in the data. But what I'm saying is, there there is data with women in it, and there's data with men in it, and it's never usually always like you can see it down. Sometimes you can see the extreme case where it's basically. Um, where it's basically producing one face. It, it learns this face is going to trick the generator, and it just produces that one. Right. Maybe it's a maybe it's a it's a it's something to do with the database that it, it's more. But what I'm saying is it does lose modes. That I don't, I don't care why. But it does, it does. I mean, it doesn't matter if this mode is is this big, right? It still exists. And my and my gun promised that it would get this, and it didn't. Well, but it's very important what he says. I actually agree with that. The issue is if the data is good, this will happen less. Yeah. The, the example that you give that learns a single face is a very interesting one. Mm. If this is really the case, then then you know, sure, there is a problem. Oh yeah, I've had that happen. But but I believe if the data is actually pretty well balanced, mm -hmm. you will like balance male, female, gender, uh, age, whatever else you want. I think then you have a better better chance. You obviously have a better chance. Yes. yes. Okay. But because yeah, obviously then these would be like that, right? But then the hope that with the, the GAN, since it's supposed to appro approximate the probability, would be able to, even though it's unbalanced, still learn um, to sometimes. Yeah, to sometimes. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. So that's what you say, that it generates a single phase. That's really crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why that happens, that's like... Uh, yeah. yeah. So, okay. That's the second problem. The third problem is something we've actually not discussed so far, is how do you know when a GAN's converged? Okay, you have a look at the pretty pictures, and the prettier the pictures, the more, the closer it is to, to find that equilibrium. But nothing tells you that, right? For 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 an optimization problem, there are ways to tell that, right? Because because you're actually minimizing cost function. You look at that cost function to see how much is it. Is it less than before? You know, guns. If you look at the generator loss and the discriminator loss, you know you can't really say. Like for example, now discriminator loss was zero. <coughs> what does that mean? It's not half that I was promised. But my faces look pretty damn good. So there's no way of knowing. That's the, that's the other thing. So there's no indication. Sorry, wrong marker. There's no indication. But this that they look good doesn't tell anything. It just pulls your eye. It has nothing to do with fooling actually the, the computer. So, so I think the way we test it is wrong. You yeah. cannot, I mean, you do, you do not have a visual inspection. It's not so much about the way we test it. So it's not so much about evaluating it. Is that in theory I should see that half? Yeah. But I don't. Separate issue. Right. <laughs> and I don't know when it's gonna when it's gonna reach that point or anything, right? 
Okay, so that's that's that. That's that's what I have to say about Gans. This will conclude the vanilla Gan part. We're good to go on the Washerstein one, which I will say I'm way more fuzzy on. So I I'm not so comfortable with it because it's much more involved. But I'll give it a go. Okay. So the Washerstein. Do you all guys want to have a break before? How long is it going to take? Not much longer. Just like an hour. Maybe. Maybe twenty minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So the Wasserstein Gan starts with the with the premise that it wants to change the distance metric on on your probability distributions, right? So and it'll come up with this metric here. Okay, don't freak out, I'll just write it. Okay, right? It's the infimum of this expected value, this is like a, a Euclidean distance, and then I'll explain everything. So this is this is called the Wasserstein one distance. Also known as the Earth Movers, very aptly named the Earth Movers distance. I, okay, so let's see what these are. X is a sample from uh, PD. Y is a sample from PG. Okay? Um, gamma is what we call a transport plan. It tells us, yeah, I'll get there. It tells us how much mass, mass should I move from x to y, right, in order to get PD to match PG. Okay? Um, right, and then this, this pi is the, the set of all joint probability distributions for x and x and y. And its marginals will be PD and PG, right? If I take, uh, sorry, the, sorry so, so the gamma belongs to pi, this is a set of all, so if I take this gamma um, dx, that will give me uh, PG, and then this gamma dy, that will give me um, PD. Okay, I, mar I marginalize over the other variable and I get the, the distribution of the, of the one, right? Okay, now it should be a bit clearer. So gamma is a body part of this Yes. So one other way to think of it um, is that gamma is this transport plan in 2D space, it's like this. This is gamma. And we said the marginal with, with respect to y is going to give you the distribution PD. This is x, this is y. And the marginal with respect to x is going to give you the distribution PG, right? And gamma, each point here, tells you how much you need to, how much mass you need to move from here to get it there. Yep? Cool. All right. Oh yeah, another way to see this, okay, I'll give you more intuition. Um, another way to see this is, is if, if gamma is indeed mass, so let's, let's, if we write this one out, then it will be this, right? Gamma x, y, um, x minus y, right? And if, if, if we were to, to look at this as being the mass, this as being the distance, right? And then this is just the sum of the mass times the distance, right? And so, so this is how much effort we have to, to, to put in in order to move all the mass from one to the other. And the infimum tells you that we want the optimal plan. Right? So this basically means the optimal transport plan from, um, from x to y. Cool. But that means that in the ideal case, gamma is just zero everywhere. If pg equals p. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yes, yes. But then it's not really a binary distribution. No. No? Okay. Yeah. Okay. D can be there. Right. But you move only point to points? Yeah, that's that's the way that I've seen it. But then, then no longer 
you have no longer have the guarantee that they're both distributions, probability distributions. What's the reading part? Yeah, this I'm not. Because if you move point to point, it's an easy problem. If you also want to maintain any distribution, then it becomes NP half. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yes, you want you want eventually. Yes, you want this to hold, right? For gamma, the marginals will have to add up to. You want the distribution of the data, but the network do not care about the distribution of the gamma. That's what you want to to change, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you don't care about the distribution of the gamma. Gamma is just the transform one, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But if gamma, yeah. Right. Four. So, why should we care? Why should we care about this fast response distance, right? Why is it better than what we've been seeing all along, which is the Jensen Shannon divergence, the cool black light bulb? are distance metrics, right? Um, okay, so the, the premise is that the Wasserstein distance is a weaker distance than Jensen Shannon and Kulbach Lever. Right? What does weaker mean, right? If you have, um, if you think that we had this PG, right, this was dependent on theta. And as we change the theta, this distribution will, will, will get a sequence of distributions, right? Um, and uh, what what the what uh, Wasserstein being weaker means is that all distributions that converge under the Jensen Shannon or Kulbach Leibler will also converge under um, the Wasserstein. Basically, uh, um, a distance metric is weaker if all uh, is weaker than another distance metric if all this um, all the sequences that converge under the other one converge under our. Okay, and in in the original paper for the Wasserstein gamma, uh, this is shown in, with a, with an extreme example. Basically, you have your your PD here. It's at zero, right? It's just a line, and then your and this is these are disjoint, right? And then you have your PG here, right? And this is your parameter theta, right? And you want to move this one to this one, so. What is, let's have a look at the Kulbach Leiber. Well, okay, these are this one, these ones don't share support. So KL will be um, infinity everywhere, except when theta is so when theta different to zero, except when theta is zero, then it will be zero. Does that make sense? Because the Kulbach Leiber divergence, if they don't have the same support, it goes to infinity. Okay, and then the Jensen Shannon divergence. Um, will end up being log 2 everywhere and 0 here. Does, it, does, it, does everyone can, see, can someone see this or do you want me to go through it? Alright, we'll, we'll show it. So basically, if you think of that the, the, the Jensen Shannon is made up of two cool bugbears, let's have a look at each term individually, right? Then this is the Jensen Shannon divergence, right? This is one term of it, right? And this is one term of it. Now, because they have disjoint support, wherever PD is zero, then this will be zero, right? Because zero times whatever, right? And whenever PD is one, P, uh, PG will be zero, right? Except when theta is, no, hold on. Sorry, wherever PD is 1, PG will be 0, so this will end up being just uh, log 2, right? Okay, so that's, that's how you get that. And if PG, is, sorry, if PG is PD, then in that case, they perfectly match, and the Jensen sign divergence is 0. So log 2 everywhere, 0, just the theta equals 0. Make sense? Cool. Okay, we've shown what's wrong with these. So these are, so so this is this is how the this is how the distance metric looks as as the sequence moves, right? Uh, and you'll notice both of them are not continuous and not differential. Right? This one's horrible. This one is less horrible, but but right, this one looks like that. 
if this is if this is zero. So, but the the Wasserstein distance doesn't. And the Wasserstein distance will look like this. So the the, the for the Wasserstein the distance will get something that looks like this. Right? Because because basically it, it just relies on this distance here. It tells you what the minimum distance between this these things is, and it's always theta in this case, right? It's absolute value because if it moves toward this way, then it's still theta, absolute value theta. So this is what we get here. This one actually is continuous and differentiable, which is pretty good. Uh, yeah, it's not in zero, right? What, it, what it's not what? Well, it's, it's not differentiable. Yeah, but but, but what? It's fine. Close. Yeah, it's is it not differentiable? No. No, it's not. Because it's not it not zero point. Because <coughs> it still should be zero, right? It, it has the, some gradients. It should take the subgradients. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so this is significantly better than that. I mean, the others had a discontinuity in zero as well, so it's not that different. Yes, except this one subgradients don't work out. Uh, well, it just has an infinity of subgradients. It's yeah. more than this one actually it has this convex. Yeah. So this one, this one's pretty good, and and this is this is the reason why we wanted to use the Wasserstein distance. Right. Let's get rid of this. Da 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 da. Oh, also something else is um, for these ones. The gradient is zero at certain points, right? Uh, at a lot of points, and so basically, another thing. So to 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 add another thing to your question is, this one has a gradient of zero everywhere, except here where it doesn't. But but this one this one you can calculate the gradients, in, right? So th so that's pretty good. So this is why we, we'd like to use this as a distance metric. The gradient there is still 1, so it's a constant. It's not 0, it's 1. But you take steps based on the gradient. 0 is bad. Yeah. 0 is vanishing. Uh, yeah, sure. 0 is vanishing in the way that... So yeah, yeah, yeah. The way that the blue is not... No, no, I, it's also I, I totally agree, but like, it's not that different. All that, that's all I'm saying. Massive, massively different. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's massively different. Zero. If I multiply any weight by 0, it's 0. Uh, yeah, sure. Let me say every part of the stationary points. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll explain later, but it's not that different. Okay. Right, so, all this is nice and this is all, this is all good, except, except this is so, so damn hard to calculate that what, what good is it practically, right? So, this is the one proof I will skip. Because it takes four pages up on my notes. Um, I'll just give you some intuition, just mainly because Lynn wants it. Um, right. So um, this actually can be formulated as an LP. I'll show you how. Uh, so this can be written as Inf well, let's just put it in this in this sense. Ct x. Imagine c is a large vector, okay, and we'll only do this for the discrete case. So imagine the discrete case. Imagine c is a very large vector that has all the distances. Right? Oh, actually, I do have a slide for this, but later. So um, C has all the distances. It's a very big vector with all the distances, right? And then X is a big, very big vector with all the gammas, all the combinations of gamma, right? So then this is uh, basically this is a a dot product, right? This thing here, the, the, this integral will be a dot product, and we're looking for the 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 infimum. Of this thing, right? Now it's starting to look like an LP, right? You agree? Uh, and we've got some constraints as well. What constraints do we have? Well, we have that 
these marginals should uh, equal the probability distribution PD and PG, right? So that means we can come up with a very large matrix A. Well, if, so if we, said, we said these are the gammas. This is what we're trying to, to minimize with respect to. These are the, d, uh, are the um, distances, right? This thing here will be a vector with um, PD, PG. And this will be a matrix so that the, the sum over all x's will be uh, PG, and the sum over all y's will be PD. So if you want to see how that looks, You need your password then. Oh. <laughs> um, but B, B is not fixed, right? B very changes. So you take it for all, all, all of the points, right? This is a very large vector. You take it for all the support of, of the. Okay. This is a discrete case. Okay. Just in Vector or matrix? Vector. A, a, a vector, yeah. Very, very a very, very long vector. Uh, with PowerPoint, yes. Nice. Yeah. So, so, this is what it will look like. Right? Got all your gammas. You got all your your PR. Your PR is just the PD here. I just think it's from uh, from log where I found it. Um, and then this is your uh, this is your P PG, right? So theta is G and R is P for us. Uh, and then this is this is this is what you have here, right? So th this is this is formulating into an LP. And one other constraint we have is that we want um, x to be positive, right? Because it's a transport plan. We, wanna, we always have to transport positive mass. Cool. So then, if we can formulate it in this point, we mean, it means we can find, we can, instead of solving this, we can solve the Lagrange dual of this problem. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead and do a course on Lagrange duality. I mean, we, we can discuss it if you want afterwards. Um, about how, well, what the first steps are to, to, to doing this, but even after even after you formulate the dual, there's still a lot of work to getting it to its final uh, to its final um, state. So I'll just go ahead and, and, and spit a result here, which will be um, so the Wasserstein distance, and then you also have to prove that it's uh, that it's a uh, strong uh, duality and all that stuff. And so we'll do that. Pg Pb equals supremum of f of x minus sorry right so this is the supremum uh, of this quantity taken over all uh, Lipschitz 1 uh, functions, right? Now what's the Lipschitz 1 function? It's just a function for which, so if you had, let's say, um, a, a function that mapped x to y, then this one, okay, then this one would just mean that the distance in y of f uh, x1 comma f x2 is smaller or equal to the distance in x of x1, x2. Right? This is it. It's it, it, it basically telling you that, um, that the slope of this can never be bigger than 1. So th this, is, this is what we want. This is, this is the, fun, the type of functions we want to use. And, and, and now this, this f here, is, is taking the role of our discriminator. 
Uh, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, still, this is very hard to calculate. So we've, we've, we've done all this, and this is still hard to calculate. So instead of this, we can calculate the maximum. Right? So the maximum will be less than the supremum. Right? So we, we sort of get a, uh, a lower bound on this. Um, right? So the maximum of this thing. Um, so yeah, so we said the discriminator is going to be this this function f. Now that would be good. We can still we can calculate this the maximum, right? For 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 a given set of weights, we have this function here, and we can calculate this. But but how do we guarantee this? Well, here's where the the authors don't give a a a, a good way of doing this. They they instead. Um, do uh, they instead, instead come up with a guarantee for k Lipschitz? So yeah, so basically this changes to that. So they tell you that if you have a neural network, then it will be k Lipschitz the, 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 as a function, provided that you can regulate the maximum weight. So so the and you, by the way, you don't you don't know what the k is. Uh, you just know that there will be a k, and um, you know that there will be a k, and it's dependent on the maximum weight and the, the depth of your neural network, right? But you don't know what it is. But you don't really care um, because if this becomes k Lipschitz here, then basically what will happen is this will be equal to this will be scaled with respect to the vast side distance in that way. Right? So instead of calculating the vast distance, you'll have a, a scaling factor, which is k. Right? Okay. And so, so, so the way, so since we don't, so we will concede that this is going to be an approximation. Um, but still, I mean, we'll, we'll be able to calculate an estimate of w. Uh, and the way they do this is they clip, they clip the, the, the weights of the, of the neural network. So if you clip the weights of the neural network and obviously you have a finite uh, number of layers, then somewhere this k will exist. You don't know what it's going to be, right? But it's a decent estimate. And basically, this, this, is, this is the whole gist of the Wasserstein uh, diagram. Right? And then the way they train a so the way they train the Wasserstein gun is you want to uh, always find this uh, this function f. You wanna you wanna find this uh, as best you can, right? You wanna train your discriminator to convergence. Right? You wanna find this. And then once you found this, then you can go ahead and take a step in the of the Wasserstein distance that you've calculated, right? So once you, you want to take a step of this one to find your de delta theta for your um, for your generator. So the difference between a GAN is that we no longer have to balance uh, the vanilla GAN. That is, we no longer have to balance discriminator and generator updates. Is we train our, our discriminator to convergence, right? And then we just take a we, we take a, a, a step a gradient step here. And what's good about the, and we're using the good properties of the Vasher science function because we've shown that this is actually differentiable and should be, you know, it should be a nice function to, to go down, uh, to, to descend, right? And, okay, one more thing is that as opposed to the, the GANs that we had before, so what were we, what were we doing with GANs before? We, were, we had this cross entropy loss. Right, we were, uh, we were taking that for our rate of descent, and then we showed that that one minimizes the jensen shannon divergence. But and we saw that there's some caveats there, but we we never actually calculate the, we never explicitly calculate the jensen shannon divergence. Right, we have no idea of what that is. The good thing about the Wasserstein uh, gun is that we actually do calculate this. 
We evaluated this function, and this is a distance metric. And then, based on the value of the Wasserstein distance, we know how close we are to, yes? So you don't know it because you don't know the k? Yes, okay, you know it within a scaling factor, but you have an estimate of it. But you don't know how big the scale is. You don't know how big the scale is, yes. But it's still, so, so, so yes, there, there would be, there's potentially a, a field of research which will calculate, which will be able to determine k. If you could determine k, by the way, I think, my opinion is then in that case it's actually solved, solved right? Because then if you know k, you can actually find what the actual batch size is. Or an integral. Yeah, but but yes. So so but it's still it's still an idea. It doesn't matter if if k is um, if k yeah. is big or small. The Wasserstein distance will decrease, right, as you train. And that's basically that's basically the whole gist of Wasserstein counts. And that's the end of so it. So because oh. you don't know the k, basically what you know is whether it decreases or increases, you know the direction. Basically, what you mean. yes, yeah, the k is just a scaling factor. It doesn't it doesn't uh, yeah. You still do not solve the theorem, but uh, I don't see that you solve the whole class. Hmm? So the only thing what you solve is the, hmm? the yeah, um, you the, the premise is that because you don't have, the, the mode collapse is just a. We saw it was when you had the, the vanilla game uh, with the non-saturating uh, game problem, and then when you trained the, when the discriminator was too strong, you would get that problem, right? We only showed it in that case, the mode collapse. Right? In the in the in the normal case, we showed that it should actually get that distribution, but in practice, no one uses that anyway. So uh, we, we showed it that it, in that case it happens, and that's and and the the, the solution to that we said was um, that you get uh, that you'd have to balance your discriminator and generator. But here you don't have to do that. This is the premise. So actually, in, in practice, the Wasserstein gun does actually converge more often, and uh, and does have less mode collapse. No guarantees, of course, because you yes yeah you don't know. But yeah, that's that's that. Phew, that was a, that was really nice.